So how did the video project emerge and what was your intention behind it? Um, the video project came out of the necessity to rethink the way we teach uh, in medical school and specifically in neuroanatomy. It's traditionally a course that is very difficult for the students. There's a lot of content and they're very overwhelmed very quickly. So I wanted to um, break it up a little bit and give them the content in, in manageable pieces. So we created nine videos in the first iteration accompanied by about 20 modules for the didactic content and then we changed the um, session itself, the lab session, to be more interactive and um, th where they could apply their knowledge to clinical scenarios. So, you know, a classical flipped classroom kind of approach. But we then went ahead and posted everything on the web for public access and the materials just kind of went viral. They went everywhere. There's a lot of universities now using them and we've got a lot of hits on YouTube on our videos, which we're of course very proud of. <laughs> um, and what was the process of putting the videos and the online resources together? Making digital media is a very long process. So I went into it quite naive, um, not knowing what it would entail. And when we first wrote our scripts, they were almost written like textbooks. That's what we knew how to do, how to write a lecture or how to write a textbook. But doing a video or a module is completely different and you have to play to the strengths of the medium. So we spent hours and hours in a writer's room going through it over and over again. And actually, Zach Rothman from MedIT was instrumental in focusing us on what the medium could do. Um, and so we tried to get it to be interesting for the viewer, to have a hook, to make it really relatable to them, and give them memorable moments that they could always think back to, to hook you know, the content off to. And were there any challenges or just successes that stood out? The challenges are probably um, the timeline of production. I mean, you have these hours in a writing room where you're working on it, and then when the actual filming comes, you're filming 12 hours a day with a professional crew, and you're not uh, filming sequentially, so they're telling you, we're doing this now, which is, you know, video three, scene four, and you're just doing it, and everything is on a teleprompter, and you're presenting the information, and then you jump to something else. So you have to just let go of everything <laughs> during the production days, and just follow instructions. Everything has to be done for the production day. You can't change it once you're there. Um, and then the other challenge was really to understand the medium, to really know what would work well on film. And without a team of experienced people, it, would, it wouldn't have worked. We, I think we would have produced something that would, would have been quite boring. Um, but to really have um, that creative side come into it as well, um, then stimulated us. So in a way, it was a challenge at the beginning, and then it turned out to be a great success because you know, once we understood the medium, we could start playing with it. And in fact, when we did uh, the second season, <laughs> we basically took the nerves from the central nervous system into the gross anatomy of the, the body, um, we had a lot more fun with it because we knew the medium and we knew what would work and, and how to play with it. And what has been the impact of this project, um, especially as it relates to your own teaching and also to student learning? I think the impact um, it has, has several levels. One, um, for the students, I think it took away their fear of neuroanatomy, and it's actually something that's documented in the literature. It's called neurophobia, or the fear of medical students for everything that is brain related. And it doesn't just happen in undergraduate courses, it goes all the way into clinical practice where practitioners are kind of scared of um, symptoms that relate to the brain because they feel they can't deal with them easily. Um, and so I feel that by making it more accessible, by having the content available for students and then postgraduates as well, I'm hoping that we were able to get rid of that neurophobia a little bit and make it more accessible and more understandable for students. And um, sort of a question about open education. What are the benefits of open <coughs> education more broadly? I think open education is where we have to go 
I think it's our social responsibility to do this. I don't think that we can stay in our ivory tower and keep the knowledge to ourselves. It's not within the tradition of what academia or universities are. Um, we've always shared our knowledge and now with digital media it's become easier than ever. Um, especially when you look at access to post-secondary education worldwide, there are a lot of countries who can't afford to produce media like this. We can. And so we should share that information and with that, um, you know, facilitate access to post-secondary education for anyone. And um, can you talk a little bit about um, your work internationally and what's happening right now? Yeah. So. Yeah, so um, because these videos are accessible everywhere and they kind of went viral, I guess, a little bit, I, um, I've built up a network of collaborators who are also interested in creating digital media for education and in, in medical education, specifically in anatomy. I guess we kind of all found each other that way. And so we're all working together um, so that uh, we don't recreate things that other people have already done so that we can actually say, okay, you know, your students are working on something on the heart. Um, you know, we can use that in this way and we can add the following modules or information to it so that we, in the end, come up with a repository of resources that can be shared uh, for everyone. We're all really passionate about open education and not hiding things behind a firewall or a university access code or something like that so that we can share it with everyone. Um, we've reached out to universities in developing countries to offer collaborating with them as well so that we can form partnerships um, with groups. Um, currently we have some uh, contacts in Africa where they are already accessing our online materials and now we're looking at um, collaborating to create media locally um, that we can in turn then use here um, at UBC or um, at the universities my collaborators come from. And have, were you speaking at a UN conference or something? Yeah, we presented this project at a um, conference on development in Namibia in December 2014, no, 15, sorry, uh, so let me say that again. Um, we presented this project at a conference in Namibia in December 2015, and this conference was organized by SANORD, which is a collaboration between Scandinavian countries um, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, so the idea is that affluent Nordic countries are collaborating with universities that um, I guess need more access to information and, and um, this conference was sponsored in part by the United Nations um, and really played into their post-2015 agenda. So the United Nations had put out a, an agenda to look at um, where post-secondary education would go. And right now we're looking at the world after 2015. They had a big summit in 2015 to look at where, how much they had accomplished. And now really the um, one of the main foci of, of this agenda 2015 or post-2015 is to um, have more and more digital information available as open educational resources. And so we are actively working on um, contributing to that for medical undergraduate education to begin with. And um, just back to open education, um, what do you think um, the impact is um, on students, faculty, and the institution? I think the impact, again, has different layers. I think the more an institution opens itself to the world, the better it is for the institution. The more we are aware of you know, the challenges that other universities have and, and the more we can reach out and you know, really collaborate as partners to, to work on these more global issues such as ac access to information and access to education, the better it is for everyone. I have a group of students working with me right now on creating these uh, resources. It's part of their coursework. And they are completely thrilled and empowered by knowing that the material that they create will go beyond UBC, that this is actually going to have an impact and, um, and I guess, change the world in just a little bit. And um, what's your next step with perhaps this project or any other projects <coughs> or ideas that you have? 
I think the next step is to really organize the repository and um, advertise it so that more and more people can have access to it. Um, so I guess we're still in that initial growth phase of really putting it out there and making sure that well, when people know about it, they can access it. Bugs are uh, taken out of the website, making the website more accessible and um, you know easier to navigate. Um, and then, as a next step, we'll be looking into technologies that will enable us to have students collaborate directly in more of a, I guess, digital classroom. So that, I mean, this is not something I envision next year, but I, you know, in the sort of midterm future, I envision. UBC students working directly with students in Namibia or Uganda or Argentina, um, learning about the limbic system, let's say, and they're all sort of collaborating in sort of a digital classroom on that content. Uh, um, and do you plan on adding more videos, or are you? Yes, we want to add more videos to really grow that video library. Um, so we're currently working on a script for a new video and I'm looking for funding for it and we've got more ideas on how to grow it and make it modular so that it, you know, doesn't just work in a medical school context but in undergraduate or other health professional context as well. So we want to grow that and we want to grow um, the online modules that accompany that. So that's for the didactic component of it. And then the next part of it is more um, working on the application of knowledge component and um, the collaboration component. And I think that's the second step. I think our first worry right now is to get the didactic repository that out there and then work on more collaboration tools. Um, do you guys have other questions? I have one little one, if that's all right. And don't look at me. No, no. <laughs> I'll uh, pretend you're asking it. Yeah, I'm just curious if, and I don't know if you do, do you have any stories of people using your materials, like kind of stories of open that you didn't expect or that are interesting? Yes. So. I get emails um, every, every, almost every week from around the world from people using these materials and um, they come from all over the world. So I was uh, really surprised and I guess thrilled to get an email from Iraq from somebody in Baghdad who had accessed these videos and was studying with them and had some follow-up questions. Uh, I've received emails from Bangladesh. I've, uh, when you look at the hits that the website and the videos get online, it's really from all over the world. Um, and I think that can fill an institution like UBC with a lot of pride that what you know we're producing actually has an impact uh, for education um, everywhere. Um, the resources are currently used as a formal part of the curriculum in, in several countries, so it's being used in Amsterdam. Um, as part of the medical undergraduate curriculum. It's being used at several universities in the United States. Um, so the resources are being used um, by faculty and by students. It's often the students who find it and then it kind of goes in, you know, through the student web, they forward these resources to each other. And in fact, right now, when you put neuroanatomy into Google, our website is the first one that comes up. So that's, I guess, a kind of a success story of an open education resource. Yeah, I have one question, actually. Yeah. So, um, I mean, in order for the, these videos to be produced, there's a certain amount of resources that are available to you um, and to the team that may not be available to faculty or in other institutions. Um, what do you think are some other ways of engaging with open education that these faculty can Yeah, so I think what we produced here were very um, highly produced, high quality videos and they, you know, they cost a lot of money to produce through, you know, we were lucky to have TLEF funding for that. But there are a lot of ways to produce media with a lot less money, with a lot less resources. And in fact, some of my collaborators have done that and they've engaged the campus community. They've engaged uh, film students to be part of the project. They had um, students in arts come in and help with script writing and then they had students presenting for students and filming it with, um, you know, just with regular cameras that everybody has accessible, I guess almost on their cell phones now. And so they were able to create 
media very um, quickly and on a budget which is more accessible to everyone. Does that kind of cover what you were thinking yeah, yeah. about? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That was quick. <laughs> is there anything you want to add? Um, no, I think that pretty much covers what we've been doing. It's a, it's a fun project to be part of. Yeah. It really is. Yeah.